Well, good morning. Jesus said, Are you tired? Worn out? Burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me, Jesus said, and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Two weeks ago, we finished a four- or five-week series on curveballs, on things that happen to us that we don't expect, but happen to almost all of us. And we don't usually see it coming. And uh, two weeks ago, we talked about just being worn out. Uh, At the end of my rope... um, whether that's burnout or whether that's just, I'm just done and I can't do this anymore. Um, And I got so much response from so many of you that I thought maybe it would be worth taking time again this morning just to revisit that. Because two weeks ago when we did this, I spent almost all of our time talking about Elijah and that story, that situation in Scripture And then, because of time, just really quick, I went, one, two, three, four, here's what God did. And so I want to just slow down today. Let's revisit that and repeat some of the things that we did. But I want to do the opposite. Let's just really recap the story quickly, and then let's take some time to really dig into what God did. Because I think there's some really critical principles there for our lives and how God uh, works in us and through us and... um, and so let's take some time to do that. If you have a Bible, go to 1 Kings chapter 19. And I'm not going to read lots of it today, but I will refer to it. And if you have your Bibles open, I think it will help you as you follow along. If you were here two weeks ago, this will be very familiar. If you weren't, um, I want you to understand the context of this story. And in 1 in first Kings 18 and 19... Uh, We have this situation where Elijah, who's the prophet of God, is in confrontation constantly with the king of Israel. His name is Ahab. And uh, there comes to the showdown where um, Elijah, who believes in the true God, is faced uh, face to face showdown with over 400 prophets of Baal. This, this, this idol, this false god. And so they're on Mount Carmel, and if you read the story in chapter 18, um, they, they build two altars, they put uh, an animal on it to be sacrificed, the prophets of Baal go first, and they pray, and they pray, and they pray, they worship their god, they call down fire from heaven, and nothing happens. And they take the better part of a day, and there's no response from their god. And then Elijah comes up next and they douse it with water over and over and over and dig a trench around it. Even that's full of water. And he just simply asks God to prove himself. Fire bolts down from heaven and ignites the whole thing, licking up all of the water and everything. And that great show of God's power, that that great demonstration of the reality and the truth of who he is, Uh, resulted in a fantastic victory that day. But the king, whose wife was Jezebel, Jezebel was uh, ridiculously deeply involved in the religion of worshiping this Baal. And she fired death threats to Elijah. And so we see coming into chapter 19 that after God proves himself, after the enemies are crushed, there's this death threat, and Elijah afraid for his life, runs. And he runs into the wilderness, and he's getting as far away as he possibly can. And partway through, he ditches his servant, the people that are, accompany him normally, and he's all alone and runs further into the desert another full day and finally collapses underneath a scrub brush, a broom tree. And there, in complete exhaustion, Worn out, 
uh, very depressed, and very full of fear, just prays and said, God, just take my life. I'm done. I can't do this anymore. And I don't know about you, but I've been there in my life. To the place where we work and we work and we work and we see God do great things. We have good days. We have bad days. We have struggles. But I've worn myself out to the place where I just, I can't do this anymore. I'm done. And what do we do? Like Elijah, we usually, almost always, run away from people. We retreat, even the people close to us, his servant, the one who could have constantly maybe reminded him of what happened yesterday and how awesome that was. He ditches him and runs off all by himself. And Elijah is tired. He's done. There's no hope for him. I'm done. I'm worn out. I'm in a hole. The hole is getting deeper. And we see here in in chapter 19 that he sleeps. And he sleeps. And at one point, God sends an angel down to wake him up. And there's bread and there's water there. Wakes him up and he says, you need to take something to nourish yourself. Eat this. And he gets up and he does. And he's out again. He's sleeping. And then um, in verse 7, um, we see that he, uh, he's fed again. And, it, and God encourages him to get up because this is not the end of your journey. Get up and keep going. And Elijah has enough strength to journey. And, and at this point, he journeys towards a place where he knows historically people have met face to face with God. Way to go. Good move. I'm done. I'm out of energy. But he has enough energy. And he, he actually goes intentionally to a place where God, where he believes God will meet with him. And he goes there, but he, he finds a cave. And he crawls into the back of the cave, and he sleeps. And, and, and if you've been in a place like this, you, you get this. You understand this. All of these things don't sound logical when we're healthy, but they're real. But he spends some significant time there alone with God, face-to-face with God. He's not necessarily healthy. He's not healthy yet. But, but we talked about that for probably half an hour two weeks ago. And then I took three minutes to do this. What does God do? We know Elijah's situation. He is completely worn out, out of gas. He's living on fumes. He's had this roller coaster of up and down of these great things and these really low lows and these great highs and these great lows. And um, so if you have a Bible... Look at chapter 19, the first Kings, verses 5 and 6, because this is the first thing that God does in relationship to Elijah. Before he dealt with any issues, before God had any conversations, before there was uh, problems fixed or anything, God deals with Elijah's physical condition. The very first thing God does is give him rest and nourishment. And folks, I believe that's not coincidence. When we're at that place in life where I am that done, that I can't face people, that I'm exhausted, that that the, the garbage is piling on and on and on, and I am done, I can't do this anymore. The first thing God does is deal with the physical strength. And a physical rest. In, in um, chapter 3, or, or sorry, verse 3 and verse 4 and verse 5 and 6, we see that the angel provides food. But then he sleeps again. And I want to say there's no instant answer. He's not just all of a sudden healthy because God brought him nourishment. He sleeps again. In verse 7, when the angel comes again, and brings him more food. This time the angel says, you need to get up and eat because there's a journey ahead of you. Now think about that from Elijah's perspective. Elijah is done. He's actually said to God, kill me now. I am done. And God gently says, this isn't the end of your journey. This is the middle of your journey. We've got lots of road yet to cover. 
You need the nourishment. You need the rest. Get up and eat something because the next part of the journey, you're going to need the energy here. We come to verse 8 and 9. Verse 8 and 9, he's strengthened by the food. And then he has this new energy. And it's not all of a sudden everything's better. But briefly, he has energy. And he actually gets up and gets going. And I think that's a critical thing. Because if you're like me, when I feel like that, getting up and getting going is the last thing I want to do. But it's interesting here because he actually gets up and travels towards where he believes he can meet with God. He goes, it says in, um, in, in verse 8, he says, He got up and ate and drank, and the food gave him enough strength to travel 40 days to Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. Now, Mount Sinai is a place all the way through the Old Testament so far. This is a place where people met with God face to face. This is where Moses saw the burning bush. This is where Moses went up and got the Ten Commandments. And so I think it's a really interesting point that with the little energy that he has, he does whatever he can to get to a place where he can meet with God. And it's a beautiful picture there. But he's not healthy yet. He gets there, and what's it say in verse 9? He came there and came to a cave and crawled in and he spent the night there. He's not feeling awesome now. God just gave him a miracle of all this strength from a little bit of food to travel that far, but he's now crashed out again, and he's actually gone from under a scrub tree to now in a cave, which maybe is even worse. He's not better yet. You can see that. I don't think it's a coincidence here that God intentionally cares for Elijah's physical needs first. In the cave, he's not done yet. He's exhausted, he's hiding, he's avoiding, he's sleeping. And in verse 11, in verse 11, God says to him, go and stand before me on the mountain. So he's alone in the cave, he's alone with God, he's quiet, he's listening, and God says, get up, come out to the edge of the cave, stand on the front of the mountain. And if you continue to read there, it doesn't say he does that. It doesn't say he doesn't. But God starts to do some pretty crazy action type things. And all it says is, Elijah just stood there. If we read ahead, we'll come to it in a second. I don't think Elijah came to the mouth of the cave and stood on the mountain like God asked. I think he just stood there. And what happens is God sends, um, it, it says here, go to the stand of the and stand before me on the mountain. And Elijah just stood there. And God passed by, and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was so terrible that the the blast was so terrible, the rocks were torn loose. But God was not in the wind. And the wind was, after the wind, there was an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. After the fire, there was a sound of a gentle whisper. The windstorm. Wow, look what God's doing. This is amazing. God's in control of all of of nature. But that's not where God was. And And then after the windstorm, an earthquake. Wow, God is amazing. Look at this demonstration of power. But God wasn't in the earthquake. And then the fire raged and God wasn't in the fire. And then there was a gentle whisper. In the silence, after all this fascinating, great, loud, rumbling things, there was silence. And in the silence, God whispered. And look at what it says right after that. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak. And he went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. That's what God had asked him to do before. Now, as I read this, I talked about this a little bit last time. When things are difficult, when I'm out of gas, when trouble is piling up around me, 
what we typically want God to do or what we would pray for is God to do something spectacular. God, do a miracle and pick me up out of this. End this. Give me a right mind. Let me be healthy. Fix something. And we sit there and wait for God to do something amazing. And you know what? I think what's happened here is God did amazing and God did amazing and God did amazing and God showed him that's not what God's interested in. What is God interested in? In the silence to listening to his gentle whisper. God is far more interested in the intimate and that's where he speaks to us. We want the spectacular. We want the immediate change and result and healing. God wants the intimate. You can see that here, right? That was the second thing. After God deals with the physical need and the rest and the nutrition, then God takes Elijah deeper to look at what the real issues are. What's the real problem? You're afraid and you're running, and you're pressed. God, and God, it's almost like God says, okay, now look at me. Listen. Look at all of the things we've done together. You go back over the 10 chapters before this, and there was ridiculous miracles. And then times of alone and depression, and there were ridiculous miracles, and then times of alone and depression. And Elijah has this roller coaster, but God says, what's the real picture here, Elijah? You've run because of somebody's death threat. You're listening to the lies. You're listening to these voices that are chasing you away and you're terrified. But hello, Elijah, I'm still here, God says. And I have not changed. I am the same God that threw fire down from heaven and lighted that altar and everyone saw and a nation turned back to God, and you ran away because you're afraid of a woman. He said, I haven't changed. You're believing lies. And I think I said a couple of weeks ago, God wanted to take Elijah deeper here. And, and, and many of you have had cancer, or family, people in your, in your family that have had cancer. And if you're talking to the doctor about that, and the doctor said, you know what? Here's the issue but this is really going to hurt. And this is going to be a long haul. So eh, let's just take a little bit. Let's make it easy for you. You know, in that situation, what do we want? Go as deep as you need to go because you need to get it all. And this is what God is looking for here. And I think we long for the big, spectacular, miraculous answer from God. Well, really what he wants is the still, small voice to go deep and intimate. And, and you know what? In this situation here, I wish we had way more detail. We don't know how many days they were on the top of the mountain. We don't know how long these conversations were. We don't need, we, we don't know anything about what issues in his life that God pushed or prodded about or they dealt with. Um, we don't know how much more sleep he needed or how much more discussion there were. But if this were you, or if this was me, I think the things that God would be bringing up are my selfishness issues and my fears. The fact that my life has been a roller coaster in relationship with God. And how often I operate on my own strength, and then I'm completely worn out. And, and that's really just from a lack of trust. And maybe he dealt with control. Because a lot of us want control, and yet we surrender control to God, but we keep taking it back. And maybe, like here, God wa uh, we want God to do huge, amazing things, and God may. But we're missing the little things that God is doing every day, because all we want to see is the spectacular. And God might do the spectacular, but you can bet it's because he wants to talk to you in the quiet, in the intimate. And are we quiet long enough to really listen, to let God do what God wants to do in the quietness and the stillness of my heart? 
to bring up the things that he wants to see change and grow in me. I'm not sure we're quiet long enough to listen. Here's the third thing that God does. He, he first, he deals with the, the physical side of this, the rest and, and the nourishment. The second thing is uh, that he, uh, he, he takes Elijah and makes him face the real problem. The third thing is, is God speaks to Elijah really personally and specifically. In verses 12 uh, to 18, they have this conversation. And I want to emphasize here, what was it that actually got Elijah out of the cave? Well, first, why is he in the cave, right? He's run. He's abandoned everybody that cares about him. He's run to be all alone and then he goes even further, and he's hiding in a cave, exhausted and done and asleep. What actually gets him out of the cave? Not the earthquake, not the fire, not the great things of God. The gentle whisper. The gentle whisper, it says. And Elijah heard it. He wrapped his face in a cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Now, Elijah and God had a history here. And there's lots of pages in the Bible that talk about this story. And there has been lots of spectacular things as Elijah trusted God, as Elijah was bold in trusting God, and God did these great miracles. But when, when it came down to Elijah's real time of need, God doesn't blow the sky up with a miracle. He simply and quietly deals with the intimate relationship. I'm right here, Elijah. I haven't gone anywhere. Quietly, simply, relationally, and intimately, he takes Elijah to the truth and away from the lies. And when we're like that, when we're beat up and worn out and we're running away, the lies I don't know whether we're just not thinking straight, but we we allow our thoughts to roll around and roll around and we become uh, self-pitying and looking, feeling sorry for ourselves and we begin to believe the lies. Well, as God speaks specifically and personally to Elijah, look at what God says to him. This is the fourth thing. God got Elijah active again. He got him involved in life again. He got him participating. And, and I really believe in the cave, distant from everybody, doing nothing reinforces the depression. Staying away and distant and hiding and sleeping reinforces and strengthens the hold it has on us. And look at verse uh, 15. This is where God is speaking. And the Lord said to him, Go back the same way you came and travel to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive there, let me stop there for a second. God says, Go back. God had called Elijah to be in the face of the kings, to anoint kings, to confront kings, to lead the nation in battle. He had called him to pour into younger men and and call them up and raise them up in leadership. And he says here, go back the same way you came, which includes wilderness. You know what? The journey back to normal, the journey back to what God has asked them to do and to being reinstated in, in, in his work and his service, the journey back included dark wilderness too. He wasn't all of a sudden healthy. There was still a long road to go. But God calls him back. He says, come on, get up. Don't stay here. Get back to doing what you're supposed to be doing. Lead them battle. Anoint kings. Do what I commission you to do. If you stop here, you'll stay here. God isn't done with you yet. He has so much more for you. Like I said before, this is only the middle of the journey, not the end of the journey. Verse 16, he says, anoint Elisha 
to replace you as my prophet. I think this is the, the last thing here, the fifth thing that God does. God provided Elijah with a companion. God says, I've got the perfect person to walk along with you. I'm going to give you Elisha. In a sense, he's saying, go and begin to invest in others. This is what you've done before. Go and invest. Come out of that cave. Go be with people who, who, who will walk with you, who will call you out on stuff, who will challenge you, but someone that you can continue to pour into. Now, in, in the book that we've looked at uh, through this series by Carrie Newhoff, you didn't see it coming. In that book, in this chapter, Kerry says this. He says, solitude is a gift from God. But isolation is not. Isolation is a tool of the enemy. And folks, when we're done, when we're worn out or depressed or burned out, whatever that looks like, we run to isolation. And that is a tool of the enemy that will keep us from health. We need to be surrounded by people who will breathe life into us. Why is it normal to run and avoid people? Why is that normal behavior for us to withdraw? Um, I hear all the time from people, I can't come, I can't face people. Folks, that's the last thing we should be thinking. You know as well as I do that this is exactly when we need people around us. And I don't know whether it's pride or whether it's fear. Isolation is a tool of the enemy. I don't know if you, you've had a, a time period where you've had uh, a, a lot of emotional turbulence or trouble or problem or, or you know, um, an extended period and you're worn out, you're tired, you're depressed, you're, you're off, you're not thinking straight. You know what most people do? I, I think it's very common for most people to go out and get a new pet. I'm not going to ask you how many have done that. But let's say you got a cat you get a nice kitten. There's real positive aspects to that because, because the kitten or the, or the dog will cuddle with you. Uh, they won't judge you. They'll sit there and lay on your lap or lay on your feet. It's almost like the cat has an awareness or the dog has an awareness that you're, there's something wrong. And they don't do anything, but, but they're right there. And we need that. Am I right? But there's another side to this coin too because in that moment you've, done, you've bought something or you've acquired something here that's going to be some work. And you need to pour your energy into caring for that. You see that? I'm not saying that's wrong, folks, but I'm saying what we're doing is taking something that God says you desperately need to do and we're deflecting it into a pet. Because God says you need people around you who will care for you and lift you up and support you and be there. And you need to be investing in others. And what we're doing is we're taking something God has told us, you need this when you feel like that. And we don't want to be with people. We want the isolation. So we'll do that with an animal. Does that make sense? Now, I'm not saying that's a good thing or a bad thing, but I'm saying this is part of God's plan for what we need. He says to Elijah, go get your companion, your support. And we see over the next pages, fantastic support that Elisha gives him. Uh, but he also is his apprentice. It's a succession plan. And he has to pour into him and train him and lead him and teach him. It was support. It was companionship. It was a shared journey. It was somebody by his side. And it was 
pouring into somebody else's future. And folks, when we feel like that, and we feel like isolation and running away and hiding and sleeping, this is something God says we need. Do we see what God did here? God rejuvenated him physically first. And then God got to the real problem. Not just the symptoms, not just my feelings, but he, he exposed the lies and replaces it with truth. And then God speaks really specifically to him according to what he needs to do and what he needs. And my challenge is, are we actually listening? Then God gets Elijah up and going again, not assuming he's healthy yet, but get up and start participating in life and what you know you ought to be doing, and then God brings somebody alongside him to journey with him. Two weeks ago, after we talked about all of this, I heard from a lot of you. And uh, somebody gave me, here's 11 things that the Bible says we need to do. Somebody else said, here's four things I think we need to do. And as I put all of these kind of things together, and as I talked with probably about 40 of you in the last two weeks, here's where I narrowed this down in all of those conversations. And this isn't uh, anything more than just a summary of all my conversations. Number one, we need to start, especially when we're worn out, when you get to the place where I'm done, we need to eat better. And we need exercise. We need to care for our physical life. Second thing is we need to plan rest. Well, we all have days off from work. We all have vacation days. God has instituted a weekly Sabbath. And I think in our culture, we use those things very poorly. Because we don't rest Right? Our days off for our vacation are just as much work or activity or energy required as going to work. And, and, and we are terrible in our culture of practicing Sabbath. We work all week and there's one day we're not going to work. We need a day every week where we get rid of the shoulds and the ought tos. And we rest. And so I think one of the things we see here clearly is we need to rest. Let's, not, let's plan rest and don't mess with it. The third thing that came out of all of this was start participating in life. You're not going to feel like it. You're not going to want to, but we've got to start participating in life. Whether that's job or family or friends or activities we love, what is it that normally breathes life into you? Well, folks, let's start by assuming that when I feel like that, those things are still going to breathe life into me. And yet, what do we do? We avoid those things. I think we need to begin to participate in life again. Number four, we need to get with people who breathe life into you. When people want to help, let them. When people want to come and acknowledge you and affirm you, Say thank you and absorb it. Be honest and authentic with our thoughts and our feelings. When we put up masks or walls or pretend everything's okay or we're in isolation, all we're doing is pushing people away. And I believe what God is saying is we need to surround ourselves with people. And the last thing, probably the most important in this, like Elijah did, we need to mandate time alone with God. We need to run to the place where we know God is. And then maybe that's different for all of us. But we need time alone with God. No excuses. We need to find that time and place and listen to God. Listen to his voice and do what he says. Ask for the earthquake all you want. But long for the silence and the still small voice of God. This stuff happens. We get down, we wear out, we burn out. It affects us emotionally, it affects us physically, it, it affects us mentally, relationally, spiritually. And don't assume it doesn't happen to a Christian, that just because I'm a Christian, this stuff shouldn't happen. 
uh, because I have Jesus, nothing is going to go wrong in my life. We live in a world that is broken, and as long as we live here, it's broken. From page two, it's broken. But Jesus said, I've come to give you rest. And don't get caught up in just sitting there and waiting for God to do the amazing, huge miracle, lift you up and everything's all better. Maybe he'll do that. He's done that for some of you here. But what God wants is your heart. The intimate. He wants to be intimate. He wants, he wants us to let him into every nook and cranny of our lives. He wants, he wants us to know him so deeply, to trust him with our lives, allowing him control, which we often keep taking back. And I think he wants to get to those things like, why are you holding on to hurt? Why are you believing lies? Why do you like to be the victim so much? Maybe we're stuck in behaviors or attitudes that are really out of alignment with God. And in the stillness, in the quiet, which we hate quiet, in the stillness and the quiet, that voice will come and begin to deal with these kind of things. And when things come and get hard, and they're trying, and there's trouble, and there's pain, and there's brokenness, and there's emotional depression and sickness, God wants to draw you into himself. But most of the times, folks, we run to isolation. Don't run away. Don't hide as much as you feel like it. Deal with the physical, the nutrition, the exercise, the health part of this. And if it's bad enough, we need to go to a doctor. We need to deal with intimacy with God and we need to listen. I don't know if you're like me, but when I feel like this and I'm completely worn out, one of the last things I want to do is be with people. And one of the first things that suffers is my time alone with God. Folks, that's the enemy messing with us. And if you're in a small group, do they know? And are we actually letting them walk with us? Are we praying together? Last week, I invited you, if that was you, to come up and pray with people. And I was blown away with how many people told me later, that was bang on, that was for me, I needed that. But I just couldn't come up and pray because I can't tell, so I can't face people. I'm like, that's exactly what we're talking about. You need others on your journey. And maybe the way to think of this is, is heaven is home, then folks, we are walking each other home. That's our relationship. We're walking each other home. One last thing. I know now I'm over time. If you've got your Bible, go to James chapter 5. I mentioned this last week too. But I think I went through it so fast, I even missed what I was saying. James chapter 5, starting at verse 13. And this is one of those passages where when it's translated from the original Greek into English... It's not real great because we have one word and they have 50 words for the same thing. I want to help you understand this passage. It says, if, Are any of you suffering hardships? You should pray. Are any of you happy? You should sing praises. Are any of you sick? You should call the elders of the church to come together and pray for you, anointing with oil in the name of the Lord. Such a prayer offered in faith will heal the sick and the Lord will make you well. And if you have committed sins, you will be forgiven. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other that you may be healed. I want you to look really specifically at some words here. And I know I said this last week or two weeks ago too. Are any of you suffering? I don't know what word your translation of the Bible you're reading says there. But that word suffering, suffering literally translates, are you having a hard time? Are you having difficulty? Pray. In verse 14, are any of you sick? That word sick literally means, are you without strength? You're at the place where I can't do anything about this. 
Now that doesn't just mean that I have bronchitis or pneumonia or a heart issue. Because this is way bigger than that. I am without strength, I'm in need, and I have no way to get out of this. Then it says, call the elders of the church to come and pray over you, anointing you with oil in the name of the Lord. Such a prayer offered in faith will hear the sick. That's a different word again for sick. This one actually means worn out. It says, such a prayer offered in faith will heal those who are worn out. And the Lord will make you well. Make you well. Literally is will breathe life into you. Will awaken your soul. Awaken your spirit. Restore you whole. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other that you may be healed. That passage all the way through is each other, each other, together, each other. Folks, it's not a just me and God thing. It's a us thing. And we need to be holding on to each other. We need to be walking with each other. We need to be praying with each other. We need to come alongside each other. We need to help each other. The verse I read at the very beginning that Jesus said, are you tired? Worn out, burned out on religion, come to me. Come to me, Jesus said. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. Let's pray. Father, there is so much to learn in this. And I don't see how anyone could say that scripture, that one written probably 4,000 years ago is just as relevant today as it was then. This is how so many of us feel. We're worn out, we're exhausted, we're tired, we're, I can't do this anymore. Whether that's for one of a million reasons, God, so many of us are right there. God, I pray that you would draw us to run to the mountain of God to run to your word, to surround us our, ourselves with people who breathe life into us and who can, can point us to Jesus. You got, your instruction is, us, is to come to you, to learn from you, to listen to you. You will give us rest. You will restore our lives. God, there's so much in our world that is desperate for that today. May we be examples of following your pattern and your plan for us and restore us. In Jesus' name, amen.